Strong Fit started as a movement based training system, I guess. It's evolved into a lot more than that. I think at the beginning there we had a lot of people that would just come sort of like in a fighting mood to just like to argue. When I started talking about internal talk and all that shit, at the time you could even tell a crossfitter to do assistance work. Like I can't tell you how many people slam their doors in my face saying we don't do bodybuilding here. <laughs> Same people I call me a genius now, by the way. I wanted to be an athlete, so I dropped all hopes of the actual gym life. Like I wake up, go to the gym, mm -hmm. train, eat, sleep, train, coach, sleep, wake up, do it again. And I was like, this just sucks. Where am I going to grow? How is this going to grow? Am I going to have a couple more gyms? Am I just going to keep the same gym? What's my community going to look like? Like everything just felt really, really stagnant. I no longer had the passion to try and do anything. I was coaching for maybe a year. I felt like I was like a facilitator, or like a circus master. People were doing things, but I wasn't really in control, right? Like if that lion jumps into the crowd, I really don't know what the hell I'm gonna do. Um, but I am under the illusion of control. It tapped into something like, pretty deep down, I think, or, or that, I, that was very relatable and it's putting a finger on all the frustrations that I was feeling as, um, as a coach. They think they want to know what I know, but that's not true. Sometimes they want the guy on mountain who's gonna just give them knowledge bombs going like, oh, but then they forget that after that you have to do the work. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a reality that sets in. It's scary and it's ugly and it's messy and it's like, go the way you want and everything, but you have to have the two connecting. If I say I'm gonna do something, usually I might fail, but I'll try. I can take failing, I just cannot take not trying. All I do is the same stuff, it's understanding humans and that's all I do all day, that's all I study, that's all I want to do. That's... At the heart, it's a way of helping people better access themselves, their, their lives, with movement being kind of the gateway to that. Anxiety is actually a stressor, right? So it no. stresses you for things to come. Uh, yes, but uh, yes, exactly. So stressor, the problem with stressor, it can introduce a negative aspect to it. So in a pure, like non-negative way, like uh, you know, like scientific term, medical term, it is a stressor in that sense. It's forcing you to get ready for something coming. If I'm in parasympathetic, this is where my digestion is at its best. Right, okay. When I'm in sympathetic, I'm in fight and flight, my digestion takes a dive. Why? Because the blood is not supposed to go to the stomach anymore. Basically, it stops digestion. The sympathetic side stops digestion because it wants the energy to go toward action and not digestion. Okay? So, simple idea. This is science. It's been tested many, many times over. We know this. It's a scientific fact. We know, for example, that carbs, uh, especially the high glycemic kind, trigger a sympathetic response. The protein is designed for a healing phase, for a parasympathetic phase, for where my digestion has to be at the highest. You're, you're at work, everything is cool, and then you start stressing. Why? Because you need to enter a fight mode. You know the meeting with the boss is going to be bad or whatever, so you start to go like this. So first of all, what happens if you don't feed that? So there's two ways on there. You go into a fight, but you refuse the fight. So you go into flight, you have to stay at work, that means you're going to put yourself into freeze. Freeze is the dorsal part of the vagus nerve, this is where depression lives. So you'll see that if you refuse the fight and then you can't get away from the fight that you just refused, you, you'll end up in a basically in a, in a depressed state on a neurological level. So you're super empty and then basically you're super empty and you're not going to feed the carbs. So that means that you don't have energy to fight, you're going to go right back into freeze. Now let's say I'm super anxious, so I have carbs. Like most people that are anxious are addicted to carbs. So that means I'm ready for a fight, but I don't do anything about it. Then what happens? The body is going to take it back to a fight and into a freeze. 
So that means that every time you, you ingest carbs, but you don't do anything about it, you're gonna have the, it's gonna make your anxiety feel better, but then you're gonna put right yourself back into freeze, right? Which is, happens to be on the parasympathetic side. From here, you'll try to go back here, and then the anxiety will be even higher next time. And you have those basically continuous loop of people having carbs, not doing anything about it, going into freeze, anxiety goes up, so they need more carbs, don't they do anything about it, go back into freeze, and then they have that circle of things where they get addicted to carbs and keep eating and eating and eating and eating. And that correlates with the amount of depression you see basically in people. And if you see about the physical signs of obesity, it resembles a lot the, the signs of depression. My father was an actor and a movie director and a coward who had uh, four wives. Uh, he didn't raise me because he was not there, but I was raised on that side by my older brother, Jérôme. He was the smartest person I've ever met, the brightest mind to this day. He's the one who taught me how to read. He's the one who taught me chess. He's the one who taught me philosophy, all that stuff. He was 18, 19 years older than me. He was also a drug addict and someone who committed suicide 20 years ago. Before he went crazy completely at the end, I think he would see that there was a way out, right? He didn't have to kill himself. He didn't have to go crazy. What he was looking for existed. Right? He was not an intellectual quest. He was not like he refused to get out there and to to truly go in the world and do stuff and fail. Thing as he was the smartest mind, the brightest mind I've ever met to this day, no question. And he never did anything with it. He didn't help anybody. But if he could see that you get 50-50, but the other 50 makes it all worth it, right? I think I've done what he couldn't, which is actually live. What is living to you? Um, I would say it starts with two things. It starts with finding your tribe and uh, finding a way to contribute to that tribe. Our goal for StrongFit and for everybody that we work with is for humans to find themselves and to be the best version that they want to be. I don't want you to become a soldier. I don't need uniformity. I don't want a system. I want consistency. So if the fundamentals lead you one way and you find something about yourself and you're able to apply it at its fullest, we've done our job. Once you find that that you truly want to do, then you'll find your tribe because there will be other people in that. And if you can't find a tribe, then you build one. Um, I don't know how I stumbled upon those podcasts, but I watched the first the first part of it. I think it was actually through Chris Moore or something. <laughs> Initially, I was like, who the hell is this guy? Um, what is he saying? I can't really understand it. Uh, who is he? And then it's like, okay, this makes so much sense to what I'm seeing, even to my pretty untrained eye. And, and it's putting a finger on all the frustrations that I was feeling as, um, as a coach. I was coaching for maybe a year. Um, and I was like, okay, like this is, this is well and good. I'd, I'd done a few certifications related to Olympic weightlifting, to, to coaching for weightlifting um, across the level one. But it all felt kind of surface level or, or like, I don't know, see through. P people would come to these seminars and they're like, okay, well, what good cues can I take away from this that I can apply? And it's like, that's really what you're paying $600 or $1,000 for? Like, okay, I, I didn't, I, like that didn't really leave me satisfied because at the time I was like, I don't know, it felt like something that I was just doing in, in passing and it felt like, I didn't really feel like a coach. I felt like I was like a facilitator, or like a circus master. Like like people were doing things, but I wasn't really in control, right? Like if that lion jumps into the crowd, I really don't know what the hell I'm gonna do. Um, but I am under the illusion of control. I tapped into something pretty deep down. I didn't even watch fully both of them and I, I looked up like what is strong but are they are they coming to this area i saw there was a seminar coming up and at the time it was like roughly what i was making in like a two-week pay period but i was like i need i need to do this i need to i need to find out more i think that a coach needs to be able to 
understand certain fundamentals, not just uh, manage a class, not just being able to get people to finish a workout, um, being able to understand how the human body, how it learns, how it works, how to actually get the results. Um, we look at all these systems that are out there in play and they always work for 70%, 80% of the people. Why doesn't it work for the 100? There's something missing there. So if we're talking about exercise, you see people that do leg work, booty work, chest work, CrossFit, body doesn't change, dynamic doesn't change. What is there's something missing there and that to me has always questioned my value as a coach because I've coached people and nothing changes. You have to be able to be receptive. You have to be able to understand that it's not about you the coach, it's about the person there. The ego about you trying to get somebody to fold up the squat so that they can look good for your Instagram post or so that they can somebody walks in the door they go oh that person moves correctly is not what's important if you're a true coach you're a guide to allow the person to see where their solutions may lie and it's up to that person to find and work for that solution that's something that julian always did he never told me do x y and z he said go find your lats it was up to me to go find what worked for my lats and what didn't the first time i sent him i said go find your lats because i wanted to see if he was going to do it or not So I know him from Instagram and everything because I've seen him doing like powerlifting competition, CrossFit powerlifting competition. He's warming up with the guy, his next competitor has quite a lot. What the fuck are you doing there? It's whipping up on 12 year olds. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, so, but every time he sees me doing an exercise, he's going to put five more pounds and he's going to rep it and do stuff like that. So he comes and I'm like, all right. But first, uh, as always, I'm like, let's talk. Mm -hmm. And so we talk and everything. And part of the assessment, I'm always at some point asking about injuries and stuff like that. He's like, no, I'm good. <laughs> I had no injuries, nothing to really mention. I said, oh, really? Okay. And I was at a point where it was like maybe nine months straight training with no rest days, doing four to seven workouts a day. And there was no more motivation for me to train. So you were to see the man back then. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like baggy shirt, torn up MMA shorts, barefoot, biggish belly, massive beard. Basically, if he was in Venice Beach, he'd blend in with the homeless guys. Like, I'm just gonna put it out there. You know what I mean? But I went to go see him for the first time. We had the talk, we did the workout, and every time I would leave a training session with him, I would feel so much better than I walk when I walked in. Smile, it's for Valerie. I'm showing her she missed all the fun. Oh my God. Hurts. And I would feel better mentally and physically. Physically, maybe not so much because I would be just demolished. But I f would feel like I can do this. There was a, there was a a spring of inspiration, a spring of I can't wait for next week, so that I can have this same kind of inspiration, drive to go back home and train. And so every time I'd go see him, I would learn new things about my movement and what was wrong with my press or my deadlift or my squat and I would have shit to go work on I, I, they would excite me so that to me was just started driving me straight through the roof I was like I need more of this and it was like two times a week then I would go two times a week and then drive up on Saturdays for a squatter days and go squat with everybody and do strongman and it was just such a blast three weeks in six sessions in I'm like so you want to tell me about the scar on your forearm and he's like Right, so let me tell you about that one. And then he goes into the hole, like I died on the mountain and 24 hours. Like, how many surgeries? And like nine. <laughs> like, you motherfucker, I ask you the. He was like, yeah, well, bedridden for five months. Uh, I'm missing, like, then he shows me about the 28 fractured where they stopped counting in his hip because everything is still shattered. And I'm like, and you're missing part of the up there. And like, and you didn't think I should know any of this. He's like, well, I didn't want to make excuses. I'm like, that would have been a good excuse, first of all. But I was like, yeah, just, yeah okay, so uh, let's, let's define the relationship athlete-coach again. He made me earn it from the beginning. I was like, hey, coach. And he's like, hey. And I was like, well, I kind of showed up here early, and like the dude was still asleep. I would like 
just take a nap outside in the parking lot and then wake up and I'd see his truck pull up and I could tell that he could see me and he would just like like blatantly ignore me and lock the door and wait till 9 a.m. when I was supposed to be there because he didn't like taking clients too early in the morning but I would just always show up and I was like hey what else can I do can I take on your clients can I help with your clients can I just watch you coach can I just hang out and he I think he realized very quickly that I was just not going anywhere <laughs> I don't see it as a business relationship at all. We've been uh, more than friends for, I don't know, it's like four years. We, we've been dating for five years now. <laughs> well, we live together for two. The fact that he's married, I don't, I don't hold it against him. But um, it's not a business relationship. It's been more than that from the beginning. He's always been my, whatever you want to call it, my boy, my assistant, my right-hand man, my little brother, whatever you want to call it, he's been that from the beginning. So my brain starts moving and I was like, well, Julian has sandbags and I wonder if we can sell his sandbags and maybe I'll start doing this and maybe we'll start going this way. And, and Julian's like, ah. So there's, an entire, there's a number of things people don't understand. Right. And at the time, again, I'm splitting with my, uh, with my ex of 12 years. It did not go well at all. At the same time where Strong Fit is taking off, mm -hmm. right? And I'm starting to work with Invictus and I want to build a life in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of that, there's like, no, let's drop everything and let's go on a world tour. With your daughter. I'm like, I might need a second there to <laughs> compose myself. But uh, I knew that from when uh, my ex told me she was pregnant of Yaya. I freaked out for 45 minutes and I was like, okay, fuck it, let's do this. I was like on my phone, on notebooks, like trying to write out everything that Julian had done. And I was like, all this stuff is going to happen. I told her, I was like, quit your job, we're going to Europe for two and a half months before the wedding. We were engaged when Julian was coaching Richard, mm -hmm. so uh, Richard was traveling, was driving a lot to LA to meet with him. Yeah, we had our civil wedding, and Julian and Yaya came. Uh, so I was like, oh, like this, like I guess they're really like each other. They're becoming really good friends. Like his coaches at our wedding, and you know. Uh, and Richard put all this thought into giving uh, Julian a really cool Christmas present, which was like a Viking, like a Viking uh, hoodie with like a beard and stuff. So I was like, oh, we must really like his coach. So he came to the wedding. Uh, so we had a like really small thing the next day to celebrate. And that's where he told me like, oh, by the way, <laughs> um, Julian asked me to come and do seminars with him in Europe and do these things. Like we're gonna do um, some in, in LA or something like that. So I was like, oh, okay. I was like, well, like, so that was like, it's been awesome for a day. Like, it's not like I'm gonna say no. So, but I was like, okay so you're gonna be traveling a lot and he's like well we are gonna be traveling a lot I went from panicking like what do you mean i'm gonna quit my job and go travel with you to europe with julian i i knew him but not not so much right and we're gonna go live with him and his daughter so i was like okay so and then of course i said okay let's do it all of a sudden i was super excited about the idea so i called i didn't even wait till monday i called my boss on sunday when he wasn't working and told him that i was going <laughs> Mm, probably meet new people because you know it's just a different culture that I may never knew and there's so much I, I still don't know and they just kind of you know give it to me probably the food experience I think I have a much more mature taste than all of my friends combined I have I tasted a lot of things that most of my friends haven't I had duck tongue durian the worst was probably the worm I found on the street that probably was the worst Of course, when I first started, I kind of left a lot behind. Most of my friends were there, so of course I missed them a lot. So mostly, I didn't make friends around because if I did, I would have to leave and then I kind of had to say goodbye and then never see them possibly again. But I mostly made a lot of adult friends who were always you know, kind of sticking around. When we started traveling, I didn't come, like at first it was really awkward. Yeah, I was really shy and like not opening to me at all. And as time went by, like she was, like she started opening more. We even started fighting because Julian put me in charge of doing her, like helping her with making sure she was doing her homework and all this stuff, right? So I was like, 
the bad the guy. Bomb. Yeah. <laughs> so we were all of a sudden like not even. Uh, uh, she was like super shy, and then we were fighting, and like she wasn't talking to me, and I was like, what happened? Uh, there's like like an aunt I really never had, and she honestly. She just changed me. I know, just I had, just I remember used to be so lazy, like my dad doing nothing all day. And it's like, okay, up, let's go. You go train, you go do something at least. So I'm like, oh, well, okay. It took some time getting used to because I was kind of like, you know, like really finesse and chill. It's funny how like life works out because uh, I also was brought up by a single father. My aunts were the ones that sort of um, built up my like my confidence as a woman and my femininity and stuff like that. My dad, if it was for my dad, I would have been a tomboy. Like he would have, like he was terrible. Like like doing my hair. Like I would, he would just put like shorts, t-shirt, and tennis shoes sort of thing. So if it wasn't for my aunts that would put on dresses for me or make my hair and stuff like that, or you know, they, um, I would have been a completely different person. In a lot of ways, like in the daily basis. I think she's my motivation to be like like a person that I want to be but for her like show her like to be like a strong a strong woman a hard-working woman to work out to things like that are like that she sees because I'm the only person that she has uh, like the only woman that she has like in a daily basis you know uh, when he Julian like his first girlfriend, Yaya was calling her mom and like all these things that she made in up in her mind. She was really young, of course, but like she made up all these things in her mind, like oh this is it, man, we're gonna have a family and all these things, and then gone. She was falling in love with these girls mm. with Julian. Like if mm. Julian was interested in these girls, like she will be too, you know. Mm. I think like the the fact that that um that we were both raised by single fathers like it gives me an idea of what she needs um i think like if it was anybody else that didn't lack like a feminine role in their lives like wouldn't um wouldn't like uh put that much effort into offering her um you know like support and when you ask me like what has strong fit offered to you the first thing that would come to my mind is a family I see a niece in Yaya and like an We haven't talked about it, but I think he knows if if any time he needed be, like he can trust me to take care of Yaya um, forever. And uh, and that if you know and that I can always count on him. They have really changed me. All, all, all over, and be as like a man. Honestly, no words can express how much she means to me. We're social animals. There's no way around it. Like we, we used to live in you know Neolithic villages with 150 people, where you had a clear definition of your status and where you stood and where you were and everything. We have moved into a society that is much, much larger, right? And the social media where you have such a large tribe you've never been part of is an illusion of belonging to anything, especially when what you're trying to belong is not reachable. Because the people you idolize, that's not their life either. They, they're just lying to you. They even say it, that that's not their life, but people just can't. That's, that's such a driver, a natural human driver to be, oh, I'm part of that tribe. That it, it, and you want to look at people superior to you in that sense so that you can move forward. But social, we, we're going to have to learn to deal with it because that's a new thing and it's, it can be very dangerous if you don't know how to deal with it. My job is to find the people to have the strongest tribe possible, so, but making sure they do what they do with the under same understanding of why. So they're just as passionate about humans as I am, but she's doing it their way. And their way is not my way, so that I need people that are better than me at that particular color. What I've discovered works is instead of having a job and trying to fill it with someone, you find someone and you create a job for them. There's some people have, that came into strong fit because I just thought they were awesome human beings and I was like, you, we're gonna work together. Doing what? I don't know yet. But we're going to find something. Human beings find me mostly, and I'm like, cool, let's work together. And then we find something for them to do. 
people find their why, but if there's no tribe to contribute to, you have no one to do it with. It's, it feels incomplete. And finding your tribe and not being able to contribute is also a horrible feeling. How would you describe the strong tribe right now? We're getting, we're getting pretty good. We got people from that are very, very different doing their thing, so that works well. But it's still the beginning. Like we just two and a half years in. I still haven't defined so many stuff within strong fit. Like it's still, we're still so early in it. It's still such an evolution of all this. Like I have no fucking clue. I still don't know. People ask me where we're going. It's like, like I know. It's like, I just have a good idea once in a while. And I'm like, okay, we start tomorrow. And then we figure shit out as we go. You know, there's times where we're like, it's usually starts about just regular life. And then we're like, oh, I just had a fight with Daya and this happened and this happened. Do you think that that has to do with the driver of anxiety bringing her to freeze and then we're going from here and then she's lacking this and now I'm lacking this and now I'm fighting for this but really I'm really working on this and then out of nowhere just it it always turns into a strong fit conversation you know but it, it's it's people think that it's a training methodology or it's a system to use to implement to fix movement but like you said it's it's the fundamentals of how we learn of how we live of who we are it's, it's starting to turn into that we he didn't create any of this stuff he's just connecting all the dots and if we find something that's been called voodoo magic or that's been called eastern medicine or been written off as doesn't work because certain people didn't work for certain people but it starts to we start to see a connection we never disregard anything being willing to go beyond the norm and not really being satisfied or, or feeling like you've made it and okay this is how i'm always going to do things it's it's retaining that sense of curiosity or or self-improvement and improvement in how you're applying a set of principles or even questioning and challenging those principles continuously a strong fit coach isn't one that proclaims I do strong fit methodology. A strong fit coach says, hey, I'm Richard DeSevis. This is what I like to work with. This is how I like to coach. This is my market. This is my identity. I need you to find who you are and express it to the fullest because you have had some amazing, amazing roads. You've had amazing experiences, amazing traumas. Your life is completely different than mine from the other side of the world. Go find yourself and express that to the fullest because you can impact people within your own niche market. Honestly, the last two years, half of it has been learning to run a business. Like, it's not what I thought it was. Um, you know, like, the amount, you make, the amount of money you make doesn't is not necessarily relating to the amount of money that you're going to make. <laughs> you know, like that, the gross versus all, all that stuff you learn as you go. Like you, you start to make, the gross goes up and yet you don't get any more money in your pocket, sometimes less. And I go, wait, how is that working? Um, it's all the joy of that stuff and the ups and downs where sometimes the seminar for two months doesn't do well and then you'll, like it's a weird thing. Like we'll have a phase where we have, 15 people signing for a seminar. I'm like, are we doing badly? And then we have Utrecht when we had 65. And I can't tell you why. So you learn to go with the ups and downs of business, which for me is very strange. Because, you know, coming from sports, I know what's going to come and I have my days and everything. Learning a business is that, and that is mostly dealing with human beings. They think they want to know what I know, but that's not true. I think as a businessman who says that, just like make a million dollars. Like once in all life, work hard enough to make a million dollars, then give it to charity. But what you will have learned about yourself, making a million dollars, you will take for life. Mm -hmm. It's that, right. right? That's where greatness comes from. It's the work that you put in mm -hmm. to get to Mr. Olympia. So you don't want to think like right. me, you don't want to know what I know. What you want is you want to, want to put the work that I put in, mm -hmm. in order to be able to not think, not even think like me, think like you, at my uh, yeah. equivalence, uh, well, people stop fighting. People ask me what to do just so they can say, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah. If you come to me and ask for help to do something, I will always be there. Even if I don't know you, mm -hmm. I will spend time. You come to here, you knock on my door, you say, my knee hurts so bad, I need to fix it. I will, I've done it many times. Mm -hmm. For free, I'll spend an hour, I'll spend two hours, I'll communicate. Just, just a moment where, when we go from me helping you, mm -hmm. to me listening to you, about excuses as to why you're not going to do it? No. That's small talk to me and I have no patience for it. So, to find your own tribe, first of all, you're going to have to find your why. 
like the stuff that makes you get up in the morning, that the stuff you truly want to do, not the job you have to do to pay the bills, the stuff that where every day is basically what you're going to think about all day. But then, then once you have that and you understand your obsession, then the work starts of getting better at it so that you can contribute to what you try. And that's, to me, that's the goal, is making, you have a tribe and you make sure the tribe grows to be the strongest it can be. Find your why, the actions you truly want to take. Don't do the shit you don't want to do as much as possible, but go find your why and go and enter the fight to get it. Yes, we need to fight for stuff way more. Stop talking about it. That's talking, words means you've already lost. So stop talking, start doing. I like being on the road, don't get me wrong. I like being on the road. So that sacrifice I made for her, really. Uh, it's probably the weirdest feeling to not having to pack in two weeks or one day. It's just that feeling of not having to pack and I can actually leave stuff. And I have all my classes now and I'm actually starting ice hockey now and I'm finally get to go to the games and stuff, which is like a first for me too. And I already made so many friends so far. When I mean by so many, I mean, I mean by four. <laughs> And, and uh, it just honestly, it just feels so great. I kind of don't want to leave again. That's the easiest, simplest move I've ever had. Like all the other ones were such a mess. Like I moved to the States the first time, I had no money. Moved to Brazil, I had a little bit of money, spent it all, came back to the States, no money. Uh, with a, a daughter that is one, no job, no nothing. Uh, I mean, I had, uh, when I moved to Africa, it was the biggest shock ever. So everything I've ever done was always extremely, uh, Cost. Complex, <laughs> costly, emotionally or uh, physically, yeah. always complex or stuff. So this was, this was nothing. Now that I make enough money to facilitate the move, mm -hmm. it's just another place, and it happens to be the place where I'm the most comfortable because I love the Dutch culture. There's always a voice inside of me that tells me to quit everything and start. Let's move to Japan and do it again.